The low-carbon and resilient transition, as outlined in the Paris Agreement in 2015, sets the ambition of a carbon-neutral society in the second half of the 21st century. For the actors of the financial system, banks, insurance companies, institutional investors, and other financial institutions that catalyze global financial flows, this transition introduces major changes. On the one hand, there is growing pressure on these actors to contribute more actively to financing the transition. At this stage, climate finance flows are still far from reaching the required levels, which are conservatively estimated to be in the order of $4.5 to $5 trillion per year. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, points out that climate investments must increase drastically and that, at the same time, investments in the carbon and fossil fuel sectors should be considerably reduced. It should be noted that these investments currently exceed $850 billion per year on a global scale. At the same time, financial actors need to manage the risks involved in this transition to preserve their own sustainability and to support the stability of the financial system as a whole. The estimated potential losses for economic operators are significant, and the financial actors, as creditors of the latter, will be strongly impacted. Again, the IPCC estimates that the cost of inaction could result in the loss of around 12% of global GDP by 2100. In the first part of this MOOC, we introduced the notion of financial climate risk. We also studied the ways and means used by the AFD group to understand the physical and transitional risks to which its partners are exposed, and therefore, indirectly, the AFD through its financing operations. How do climate risks impact financial system actors? How are they exposed, and what are the transmission channels? In order to answer these questions, we will begin by briefly reviewing the fundamentals of the analysis of a financial institution. We will then examine the determinants and impacts of climate risks in the analysis of risks to which financial institutions are exposed. The risks that a bank may face usually fall into two categories, banking risks and operational risks. Banking risks are risks specific to financial intermediation and investment services activities. This category of risks includes credit and counterparty risks, which is the risk that a debtor client will not be able to repay its debt on the agreed date. Interest rate risks, i.e. the risk incurred in the event of an unfavorable change in interest rates liquidity risks, i.e. the risk that arises when the financial institution is no longer able to meet its liabilities with its available or mobilizable short-term assets. And finally, market risks, i.e. the risks of losses that may result from fluctuations in the prices of financial instruments traded on the markets. Operational risks, on the other hand, are generated by the day-to-day -day activities and operating environment of a financial institution. They include all events that may cause losses from inadequate or failed internal processes or from adverse external events. Climate-related risks can affect several of these existing risk categories. These include operational, credit, market, and liquidity risks. The consequences of inadequate control of these risks by financial institutions, especially credit institutions, can be devastating for the financial sector and, in some cases, for the real economy and savers. The major bank failures of recent decades are a reminder of this, from the collapsing of Barings Bank in the early 1970s in the UK to the chain of liquidations linked to the subprime crisis from 2008. Even if these events have not until now been caused by climate change, the latter could threaten the stability of financial actors in the future. In order to prevent this, some institutions have already initiated internal processes linking climate risks and their potential financial effects. For example, through a project led by the United Nations Environmental Program Finance Initiative, several European commercial banks have succeeded in providing an initial overview of the transmission channels of climate risks and to highlight the impact of certain categories of risk related to the most disaster-prone clients. 
As you will understand, the physical risk refers to the financial impacts directly related to climate change. It can be described as acute when it results from extreme events such as droughts, floods and storms, and chronic when it results from gradual changes, such as rising temperatures, sea level rise, water stress and changes in precipitation patterns. In terms of the impact on financial institutions, physical risks can manifest themselves in different ways. First of all, they can be translated into operational risk in a direct way. If the climatic event that occurs hinders the proper functioning of the institution and forces it to continue its activity in a severely degraded state, damage to the head office, destruction of servers, significant damage to material assets and human capital, etc. They can also be translated into credit risk, with a materialization of the impacts on the bank's customers, which may lead to a deterioration in their credit quality through increased default probabilities and losses in case of default. For the same reasons, the value of assets placed as collateral for loans to these clients may depreciate, also impacting potential losses. Physical risks can be translated into market risk, as changes in scientific knowledge or the materialization of these risks can lead economic actors to assess the value of assets in a given sector or region differently, which can alter the value of securities held by financial actors. Finally, in some extreme cases, physical risks can reinforce liquidity risk. In connection with the enhancement of credit and market risks, the assessment of the quality of assets held by financial institutions may lead to refinancing difficulties. This is known as second round effects of physical risks. In order to understand a financial institution's exposure to physical risks, it is necessary to understand its profile, market positioning, and asset characteristics. For example, are its activities concentrated in a particular sector, or are they more diversified? Are its assets located in a geographical area, particularly subject to physical risks, or, on the contrary, are they located in areas where we can expect more moderate impacts? Here, it is relatively intuitive to assess the diversification of an institution's asset portfolio as an element of risk mitigation. Then, a more precise analysis of the exposure is carried out on the basis of a mapping of its assets. This mapping is intended to study, on the one hand, the precise geographical location of the assets and, on the other, the different types of physical risks incurred as well as their probability of occurring in the geographical areas considered. From these raw asset elements, it is necessary to take into account the policy and the risk control measures implemented in order to monitor its exposure. Has it developed specific monitoring of its exposure to extreme weather events? Is it aware of the vulnerabilities to climatic events that affect its financial assets by geography and sector? Is this risk taken into account in the governance of the institution and at the relevant managerial levels? What are the strategies for mitigating these risks, collateral policy, additional capital buffer, risk-sharing arrangements, such as insurance? And finally, what tools does the institution have to make its clients aware of their exposure to physical risks and support them in their adaptation actions? As an example, the case of the AFD group was briefly presented in a previous course. Since 2019, AFD Group has had a map of the physical risks to which it is exposed and now uses specific tools to develop this map for its financing operations. These tools will be discussed in detail in a later course. In general, the AFD Group is now perceived as more resilient to this type of risks by its creditors and shareholders. Now, I would like to focus on the risk of transition. As discussed in a previous course, transition risk refers to the financial loss that an institution may incur directly or indirectly due to the process of transition to a low-carbon economy. Transition risks are likely to impact financial institutions through several contagion chains. Market and credit risks may occur through borrower clients involved in the most greenhouse gas emitting sectors, 
whose financial health, competitiveness, and ultimate creditworthiness will deteriorate with the introduction of transition-friendly measures in their respective jurisdictions. Whether it is a carbon tax that raises the price of energy, specific standards leading to additional investments, higher fossil fuel prices, or regulatory or administrative measures restricting the activity of borrowers, the implementation of ambitious national climate strategies poses risks for some borrowers, particularly those with high carbon intensity in their activities. We can think of the oil and gas sector, carbon-based power generation, petrochemicals and heavy industry. Again, the materialization of market and credit risks can have an impact on liquidity risk. The latter will be all the more important if the financial institution has difficulty in mobilizing the resources to carry out its carbon asset financing activity. Just as for physical risks, the analysis of transition risks consists of modeling and sensitivity testing based on different transition scenarios over a given time horizon. Here, the analysis will mobilize sectoral rather than geographical determinants as the institution identified particularly emissive asset classes likely to be exposed. Has it identified sectors that are particularly at risk in a carbon-neutral transition scenario? If so, what might be the share of assets deemed at risk in its balance sheet? The modeling must be able to capture a fine granularity of sectoral breakdown in order to understand the impacts more accurately. Furthermore, the use of quantitative models on sectors of activity, however necessary, should not overshadow the importance of indicators for measuring climate performance at the level of counterparties, assets, issuers, or debtors. The use of these two types of indicators can inform the investment decision. Once this dynamic modeling exercise has been completed, the analysis should take into account the risk mitigation measures implemented within the institution. What mitigation strategies are implemented according to the identified scenarios? How do the institution's governance bodies take these risks into account? Are these indicators included in the risk appetite framework? All of these issues, articulated within an appropriate due diligence framework, will provide a fine-grained analysis of the net risks involved. As we have seen, financial actors have implemented many measures to mitigate transition risks. For example, several banks and investors now aim to maintain the carbon intensity of the assets they finance, sector by sector, at values deemed to be in line with the temperature rise limitation goals set by the Paris Agreement under 2 degrees. In a more advanced way, a French finance bank goes so far as to integrate a climate score in its internal capital strategy. It assesses the effects of its financing on the climate by assigning an environmental rating to the asset or borrower financed. On the basis of this score, the bank applies penalties to those assets that are expected to have the highest climate impact, resulting in an increase in the analytical risk weighting for these exposures. In this case, exposures with negative climate effects experience an increase of up to one quarter of their risk-weighted assets. Ultimately, these effects are reflected in the expected rate of return on assets, which may encourage investment or disinvestment in certain sectors. In conclusion, the balance sheet of financial actors will, in all likelihood, affected by some combination of physical and transition risks. In the coming years, the assessment of climate risks and their impact on the balance sheet of financial institutions, on the assets side for banks and on the liabilities side for insurers, will be an integral part of prudential models. Since 2020, the European Central Bank has recognized in the risk mapping of the supervisory revenue mechanism that climate risks are one of the main risk factors for banks in the euro area. On the basis of the first stress test published in 2021, it considers that credit institutions should now adopt a strategic, comprehensive, and forward-looking approach to climate risk management. Even if we are only at the beginning of the adventure, this trend is confirmed in Europe, in the United States, and also more recently, in a growing number of emerging and developing countries. In this context, the quality of collaboration between financial institutions and their regulators will be crucial in addressing the many strategic, operational, and organizational challenges this raises.